Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today in the video, guys, we're going to be talking about low fuel. What is the definition of low fuel? Um, what could cause a low fuel scenario in an airliner and uh, how do we, the pilots, deal with it in case it happens? Stay tuned. Wind 31016, right, right, right. Delta 216, it's Right guys, this video is brought to you by our new sponsor, Audible. Now, if you like audiobooks and podcasts as much as I do, well then I want you to use this link here below, which will give you 30 days of a free trial, but also one audiobook of your choice. And an audiobook that I think that you will really enjoy is How to Become an Airline Pilot, How to Achieve Your Dreams Without Getting Broke. Enjoy. Right guys, so low fuel, a low fuel event of becoming, you know, coming into a situation where you are lacking fuel is probably one of the worst situations that you can ever face as an airline pilot, all right? Uh, basically, the way that we view fuel is fuel, a tank of fuel is a tank of time. So if you need more time, you need to add more fuel, okay? And this is the way that we always kind of think about fuel. Um, it's helpful for you to understand how we load fuel in the first place. So in order for a flight to be legal, when you hear the term minimum, as in using minimum fuel, minimum block fuel, for example, that fuel means that the aircraft is expected to be able to fly from its, you know, from its origin up via its cruising altitude following the pre-flight plan route down to its destination, do a missed approach at the uh, destination, fly to its filed alternate, and then hold for a further 30 minutes. Right. So, you know, by knowing that, you also realize that we always have quite a lot of fuel. Right? Fuel is not generally a problem. And this minimum fuel, you know, minimum block fuel, is something that we would only uplift if we see that there's no reason to expect any delays. So, good weather day, not too much traffic coming into an airport, nothing that would indicate any kind of delays. Well, in that case, we upload the minimum fuel. And you might ask yourself, why wouldn't you just put a little bit of extra on there? And the reason for that is that basically it's professionalism, all right? We know that we have all of this fuel available. We also know that it's very high, very, sorry, very low light likelihood that we have to divert, which means that all of the diversion fuel could potentially be used to um, to stay at the destination as well. We can commit to the destination if we had to do a missed approach because of, you know, some maybe weren't configured enough early enough or something like that. So we know that with minimum fuel, we normally have plenty of fuel. But it's also important for you to know that if we do see a reason to take extra fuel, so bad weather, high traffic density, something like that, well, then we calculate how much extra do we want? Do we want to be able to hold for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes? And we just upload that extra fuel. So we don't want to be carrying around any extra fuel if we don't have to, because fuel weighs quite a lot. And that means that the aircraft is now burning more fuel, which means that we are, um, you know, throwing more emissions out of the, into the atmosphere. It costs the airline money, which means ultimately it's going to be higher ticket prices for you. So professionalism dictates that you take as much fuel as you need and as little fuel as you need. All right. That's the sweet spot. So my, you know, the question then becomes, what causes a low fuel event? Well, obviously there are different malfunctions that can cause it. Right, um, you can have a fuel leak if um, a component breaks inside of the engine, for example, it might start spitting fuel. Um, and we have checklists for that to be able to contain the fuel. But if it's leaking and we can't stop the leak, well, then you know we will be losing fuel from that tank, and that's fuel that we were counting on having. But providing that we can isolate the fuel leak, it just means that we might have to divert, right? While we're en route towards our destination, we see that we now have less fuel, well then we divert to um, an en route alternate. This is basically what happened on the uh, Air Transat Flight 296. 
Um, those guys, they ran out of fuel um, flying from the States to Portugal. Um, they did not manage to isolate the, uh, the, the fuel um, leak uh, and they managed to use up all of their fuel. So they ran out of fuel completely uh, and continued to glide the aircraft with no engines at all down to a, um, an Air Force base in the Azores. Um, this is perfectly possible to do. The, uh, the glide, glide ratio on the 737, for example, is close to 1 to 20. So it, it, it's a good glider. Um, and I showed you in my video that I did just a few weeks ago um, what happens if you have a dual engine failure after takeoff, that it's perfectly you know, possible to fly it for quite a long while. Anyway, that's one thing. Um, the other very famous example we have of fuel starvation was the Gimli glider. And the Gimli glider was slightly different because here you had um, a, a string of different reasons that brought up to it. And almost all accidents and incidents out there is always the, the, you know, the result of several different things happening and lining up. You know, Dr. Reason's model where you have different potential um, breaches of procedures or risks and they all line up, well then that's what's happening. And in the case of the Gimli glider, the aircraft did not have working um, fuel gauges. The uh, aircrew ordered fuel but it was misunderstood so the fueler uploaded the fuel in um, pounds instead of in kilos. Uh, and the, f the air crew then inputted the amount of fuel which they thought was in kilos into their FMC, which means that when they were up flying, their FMC thought that they had a certain amount of fuel and it was calculating that that was going to be enough. The fuel gauges weren't working and all of a sudden they just ran out of fuel. So they also glided the aircraft down to a successful landing in Gimli Air Force Base in Manitoba in uh, Canada. Uh, but both of those two incidents are anomalies. Right? That's not what we normally talk about when we talk about low fuel events. Now, a low fuel event tends to happen when something unexpected happens at the airport that we're flying to. So, let's say for example that uh, I am flying into um, to London Stansted on a nice good weather day. During the day when we're going there it's not expected to be much traffic. So, I upload the minimum block fuel. Right. Then, whilst we're flying in there, when we're coming into London TMA, um, someone calls in a bomb threat to Stansted Airport, and Stansted Airport closes. Well, what's going to happen then is that a lot of the, uh, the aircraft that are flying in there are going to start diverting, and they will start diverting to their primary alternate. That primary alternate tends to be the same for almost all airlines. So, if you start to have 10, 15, 20 aircraft diverting into London Luton, well then, London Luton is going to fill up. They're not going to be able to, to take more. So if we then had fuel plan to go to Stansted and a diversion to uh, London Luton, well then, if we are in this situation now, we're suddenly in a holding pattern, waiting to divert to Luton. Now Luton all of a sudden says, we're closed, you can't come here. And now we have to divert to an alternate, maybe London Gatwick, that we didn't count on. All right? So now we're starting to, to, um, to eat into fuel that we didn't, you know, calculate on. And this is where we start getting into potential problems. Now, we do normally save quite a lot of fuel during our um, cruise phase. We also have something called contingency fuel, which is there um, to avoid thunderstorms and for, you know, unforeseen events during the, um, during the flight. But still you might start to get into a lower fuel um, area here. And what we will do then as pilots is we have three different steps to go through. The first step is to ask air traffic control what our ETA uh, or estimated time at or estimated approach time, EAT, is. So air traffic control should be able to tell us that, yeah, if you divert to this airport, there's no expected delay, you can land at this time. And then we can go into our um, FMC, our flight management computer, we can punch that in and we can see how much fuel we are going to have when we reach the, uh, the new alternate. Now, if that fuel is more than our 30 minutes of final reserve fuel, well, then we're still fine, right? If we then see that it is exactly minimum, so let's say our final reserve fuel is two tons, and we put 
everything into our FMC and the FMC says you're going to land with 2.1 tons. Well then we give a call called minimum fuel. Now minimum fuel is not a mayday call. Minimum fuel is just there to tell air traffic control that this specific aircraft has a low fuel situation. It's still under control but we can't really put them into hold. Okay, so if they have a choice between two different aircraft to, uh, to put into hold and one has declared minimum fuel and the other haven't, well then the other one is going to be the one going into hold. Now, if something now unexpected happen, let's say that there is an unexpected delay or whatever reason and we start to get a vector, we put into our FMC and we see that it's now forecast to land with 1.9 tons. Remember our final uh, reserve fuel was 2 tons. This means that we're now calculating to use our final reserve and that is an emergency. All right? That is considered an emergency. So whenever we see that, we will call our traffic control with Mayday, 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 Fuel Mentor 360. As soon as we do that, we're now in a full-blown emergency, which means that we will get priority, uh, we will get access to military runways or even closed runways if they're still landable. Every kind of bells and whistles are there to help us. But that only happens when we see that we are infringing on our minimum fuel, which is 30 minutes. So we still have 30 minutes of flyable fuel inside of the tanks. Okay? But it's still considered an emergency. Now, there's been a lot of press uh, about some, some events, which included um, low fuel events, where airlines, different airlines have been calling uh, Mayday because of fuel. Obviously the press always makes a big deal out of this saying that well it's about to run out of fuel. But you will know now and you see this that the time that the airline call minimum fuel it still has 30 minutes to go before it runs out of fuel. Okay and it's the correct thing to do. The correct thing by, by the rules following the rules is to call a Mayday soon as you see that you're infringing on the final reserve fuel. All right? Good. So what do we do then? Well, <clears throat> we will obviously try to expedite flying in to um, our alternate now as quickly as we can. But if we get a low fuel warning, which is the second definition of low fuel, that is when you actually see low fuel on our fuel gauges, right? That's yellow in our fuel gauges on the 737. Well, then we have a quick reference handbook checklist, a QRA checklist. And the checklist basically will tell us to be very careful. All right, do not make any sudden accelerations or decelerations. Uh, fly it, you know, conservatively. And the reason for that is because the, the fuel is sloshing around inside of the tanks. And the fuel pumps are situated in different parts of the fuel tanks. Now, if you have very little fuel and it's, you're doing an acceleration or deceleration, the fuel might uncover the tanks, which is not a big problem. But obviously you want at least one of the pumps to have access to the fuel. So the flight, flight crew training manual says that if you have a low fuel warning, um, what you need to do is kind of delay the, uh, the um, configuration of the aircraft for landing in order to conserve fuel. But don't delay it so long that you would require a very sudden deceleration towards the end. All right? So most likely we would just follow standard procedures to take flaps 1 and latest 10 miles, follow flaps 5 then wait to approximately four nautical miles to take gear down, flap 15, landing checklist down to flaps, and then come out with the landing flaps. All right, that will have us fully configured, stabilized at about 500 feet before landing. Now, if you, God forbid, would have to do a go around then, well then the flight crew training manual tells us to go around using minimum pitch up in order to achieve terrain clearance. And that is once again, because if you do a very sudden pitch up, then you might, you know, uncover all of the pumps and you might get fuel starvation to the engines and actually flame out. So a nice smooth rotation, obviously retracting all of the gear and the flaps as per normal procedures, and then request expedite vectors back in. We also would be discussing this. If you start to see a, a, a few low fuel warning on your gauges, we will be briefing each other saying that, okay, if we do actually run out of fuel, so if we have a, uh, a single uh, engine failure because of fuel starvation, we will do this, we'll have a plan for that. And if we would lose both engines, well then we will be operating the aircraft in this way so that we have a plan for it. 
that's always the most important thing, guys, that even if you find yourself in a bad situation, you use CRM, uh, you, you, you know, discuss among the crew to see what the best way to solve the problem is, what we will do in case something happens. Because if you, you haven't done that, if you haven't discussed the possibilities, then when these things happen, you won't have time, right? The adrenaline will go through the roof uh, and you will start to make bad decisions. But if you've made a plan about it and it happens, well, then you can just execute the plan and everyone in the cockpit will know what to do, approximately. All right? So that's, this is how we would deal with it. it. It would be a bad day. We do everything in our power to make sure that we don't find ourselves in this situation. Um, I have flown for 18 years. I haven't been close to this yet. Uh, but of course, anything like, like thunderstorms or really bad weather can come up very suddenly. And if, if that happens to us, well, then we have to make quite quick decisions of what to do. And that might include diverting to an airport, which we didn't have in our flight plan, for example. Right, guys, if you have questions about this, as always, go into the Mentor Aviation app chat and just tag at Mentor. I'll be able to answer those questions if, uh, if I'm not flying. Or there will be some other pilot in there who can answer the questions for you. Uh, all right, guys, I just want to take this opportunity to really thank the sponsor of this episode, which is Audible. Now, I am really obsessed with podcasts and audiobooks. I listen to them when I go to work, when I come from work, when I go on flights, at any time I have a chance. And if you are the same, if you like listening to audiobooks and podcasts, well then use this promo code here below. It will give you a 30 days free trial with Audible, but it will also give you one audiobook that you can choose yourself. And the title, which I mentioned in the beginning that I think that you guys will really enjoy, is How to Become an Airline Pilot. How to Achieve Your Dreams Without Getting Broke. Try it out now. Thank you guys, that's all I had for today. I hope you have enjoyed it. As always, send in your questions, send in your suggestions, and go and chat together with me inside of the Mentor Aviation app. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>